The Wachungs are the rock formations in New Jersey, right? That uh, Route 280, right? Route 280 wasn't built around the Wachungs. Route 280 went through the Wachungs, right? When you're carving a new path, that's what I feel like my experience has been, like the mm -hmm. Wachungs. That's right. That's right. right. You're, you're first, it's explosive. You have to blast through that rock. And then you have to lay a foundation. And then you have to build a road. And then you watch as civilization travels on that road. Boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site at Studio One at Eases Venice Campus. We are going to be talking about all things cannabis, all things health and wellness, all things on-demand cannabis, and much more. I'm super excited, blessed, honored to have Jason Pinsky joining us on the show. What's up, brother? Greetings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on. Really Likewise. appreciate it. Super excited to talk about all of this. For those that don't know, Jason Pinsky's background, he's had 25 years in cannabis tech, food, and media. He's cannabis producer for Vice Land's Bong Appetit, which has went through 40 episodes in three seasons. He's the first credited cannabis producer on IMDb. He's a king of mainstream marijuana, awarded by Cannabis Business Awards. And he's the chief cannabis evangelist here at Ease, where one of his focuses is creating content that is educational, inspirational, and breeds enthusiasm for the team and outward. All right, I love starting with a big history synthesis on reality. So, all right, we find ourselves here as stewards of Earth after a long period of evolution. And we are going through a period of hockey stick in our population growth, hockey stick in exponential technology, and we have now unleashed a lot of Mother Earth's resources in terms of cannabis and other plant medicines. I would like to know, what is your synthesis about the current state of humanity? Uh, I believe we are at a point in, uh, in time uh, where uh, we are expanding our consciousness as a, uh, as a society, as, a, as humanity, collectively. And um, cannabis is, uh, and THC and the plant medicine that comes from Gaia, right? Mother Earth is speaking through us at this point. And what it's allowing is it's allowing for um, us to get access to a core nutrient that is core to maintaining homeostasis within our bodies, which is keeping our body and our physical space uh, in balance. And that is, uh, it's like, are you familiar with Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs? Totes. Right, so like at the foundation, it's triangular shaped in nature, right? <laughs> like Maslow's triangle, <laughs> duh, <laughs> right? Um, you gotta wake up and make your bed every morning, man. You got to have your like you know you if you're if you're moving toward um, you know a, a not only a higher consciousness but also you know self actualization, right? It starts with your core and your environment. You like make your bed, clean your office, like start with your physical space being in order. And our physical space in this time is our our vessel, right? Our body, right? And cannabis is the essential nutrient. Uh, that allows us to um, keep our vessel in optimum health by keeping the chemical signaling and chemical balance within our bodies, right? So I believe that the work that we're doing today with plant medicines that are endogenous, right? Chemical compounds in the plant exist endogenously in our bodies, right? The reason I refer to it as a uh, supplement or a nutrient is, uh, <clears throat> is because we as a civilization are kind of going through what's referred to as an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the intention of usage in the last century, all right, in our lifetimes and in our parents' and grandparents' lifetime, it is um, different than the intention and usage going back to the beginning of civilization. Mm -hmm. all right, cannabis is uh, 
unlike other plant medicines that are, have, have a hallucinogenic effect, uh, cannabis has an entheogenic effect, right? The, uh, the word entheogen, right? And, the, and uh, it's interesting in the open, we talked about uh, educating and inspiring to breed enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And enthusiasm comes from the root of that word, of, of, of a plant that is an entheogen, which doesn't just make you see something, but it really inspires and elicits like a, uh, you know, you could call it a godlike experience, but it's not necessarily um, that you have to believe in God, right? What it, what it has done for me is it has um, started me on a path to be open-minded toward, um, to be quantum in my thinking, to be open-minded toward any and every possibility in terms of uh, outcome and not necessarily be attached. And cannabis is, uh, is in my opinion, the first um, step in terms of us um, getting our bodies in balance and preparing for the next step. You know, we see the cannabis movement and we see the cannabis industry following that movement. And then coming is like this whole secondary movement of other plant medicines that also contain things in the plant that are endogenous, uh, that exist within our bodies already. So that's the area of focus that I'm interested in, is how these plants act as a, a nutrient and or a supplement. Mm -hmm. And the order in which, right, uh, we do that. And you know, it's, a, it's important to really kind of look at um, this cannabis movement as a uh, step. Yeah, it's a gateway toward expanded consciousness. That's the gateway drug. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so I like how you took us to that our awareness, we are awakening through some of Mother Earth's plant medicines and we are hopefully moving towards a unity here. We came from evolution all with the plants and animals as one, and we need to awaken to that oneness to best prosper collectively moving forward. So it took a while for all of what we see to be happening with the not only the incredible access to ubiquity and food and water and shelter and electricity education the internet healthcare, but especially cannabis kids like your son don't necessarily see the lineage of the last 50 or 60 years that blood sweat tears deaths uh, long periods of time fighting for cannabis to be able to reactivate people. So tell us about what that journey has been 25 years for you. Tell us about what this journey has been like for those that may not necessarily, that just go to the dispensary and they're like, great, here's some cannabis, but they don't know this history. Uh, my history of cannabis was uh, like any uh, young man. Uh, I re I I recently discovered that I'm 99.8% uh, full Jew, Ashkenazi Jew on 23andMe. I gave away my DNA happily. Um, and uh, yeah, it's interesting, right? Because you, at, at some point, right, you, uh, uh, I've given up on my privacy in exchange for technology. Which is changing slowly because we will be decentralizing these data silos and then making it easier for people to get paid for their data as a potential universal base skin. I've just accepted the uh, convenience yep. and I've also been confident and integrous in my actions. And over the last several years as I've um, kind of emerged as a public figure in this space and uh, like maybe when I set my, my Facebook to public posts you know, at some point you have to just like, you know, be integrous with your actions. And then all of a sudden, certainly privacy has a huge value. But when you're uh, building a brand around yourself or around your lifestyle and kind of putting a lot of your stuff out there, and granted it's edited and, you know, curated, right? But on the same token, like I understand the value of all the technology and I'd rather be, have access to the technology in, and, and versus my other friends who are like, I want my privacy. You and, then they, and then they won't go on social media and they won't like live in 2019. 
And with further steps in encryption um, and uh, new protocols that enable the fluid data flows to occur, I think we'll uh, move past it. You will have a very interesting uh, cannabis ex history. So, you know, tell us. What is it? Well, well, like any rite of passage. Bill Pinsky, and we can call, you know, Jason by his last name. Pinsky is a great last name, goes by it for sure. So, Pinsky has a cool background where he you had an experience where you yourself had a serious surgical serious spinal injury and surgery that then took you into opioids use for a long period of time and then cannabis helped you taper off of that yeah let's just say that my intention of using cannabis um, came from you know the allure of uh, seeing being a child of the 70s and seeing the music and uh, hippie culture in the 60s and um, you know like the intention was to try to get high right like seeing that in the media and seeing how the plant was portrayed and I was like cool and then you know uh, uh, coming through that experience all through high school and college um, you know I didn't think of uh, cannabis as a as a medical product until you know great uh, 20 years into my um, experience with the plant I mean, you know, the intention had always been to, to really get high. As a matter of fact, living in New York uh, and hearing the term medical marijuana and thinking about what was happening in California, you know, to me that was like, oh yeah, anyone could go to Venice to the boardwalk and get a script and for a headache and, you know, it just didn't really actually seem real to me. And then I found myself uh, injuring my spine and uh, getting prescribed Oxycontin for uh, close to 14 years. It was 12 years that I was on it. Uh, then I had a second uh, injury on a motorcycle, which caused me to go in for surgery a second time. And now when you are opiate dependent for over a decade, and then you need another surgery, you, you have to really carefully balance the uh, anesthesia to put you down, the amount of medication that you need post-surgically, uh, it really becomes like a specialized case. And just to put it into perspective, when I had my injury in September of 2000, uh, which is when I had my surgery, I, um, I wound up uh, after 11 years on, on, on close to 12 to 1500 milligrams a day every 24 hours of Oxycontin. Now this is what we refer to as a lethal dose, okay? If someone was to take a thousand milligrams of Oxycontin cold, you're, you would die. I mean, your heart, you're sorry, you're, you, you would stop breathing. What happens is it's your opiate receptor. Your opiate receptor exists in your brain stem, in your brain, and uh, it can get, um, you know, like, um, so hit so hard that your core functionality, like breathing, right, uh, is, uh, is impacted. A lot of people who you see dying from an opiate overdose is because their respiratory system slows down to the point and they pass out and their body forgets to breathe. And this is the, uh, a huge difference in what I started to learn after my second surgery and after I actually had some downtime, right, to, uh, to start studying the endocannabinoid system. And I was able to really kind of look at Wow, you know, Washington and Colorado had passed their legislation in 2012. And this was right at the time where I had my second surgery. Right at the time where after 20 years in business, I was kind of forced to uh, be on the, on the DL, on the disabled list. I had to heal a leg injury. I was home for six months. And this is within the time frame that uh, cannabis legislation was advancing in Colorado and Washington. And I had an opportunity to really kind of see that uh, there were other uh, people. And now this is after YouTube had started to come out. You can't really, you know, o Oaksterdam University, like, you know, all of these different uh, uh, resources for cannabis education did not exist, right? Um, so I got a huge education um, based on some anecdotal stories and some were uh, 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 physicians, PhDs and, 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 and doctors and, you know, scientists, chemists, people that were really starting to look at the uh, plant from a more analytical approach and starting to really uh, the discovery of the endocannabinoid system and um, I started to kind of look at medical cannabis from a different perspective 
in terms of like, how could this help me, right, um, get off of opiates after, you know, 11 or 12 years. So that was my, my journey was like starting out from a uh, intentional place of trying to maybe get high or trying to escape and then using my uh, background in technology as a computer scientist to become almost like a cannabis right, uh, scientist. And, uh, and my knowledge of biology and chemistry wasn't traditional. My knowledge of biology and chemistry was as it related to cannabis chemistry and the compounds that the plant was made of and then within our bodies, um, how those chemicals interfaced with our bodies and taking us into my uh, starting to learn about the endocannabinoid system and the difference between like an opiate receptor and a cannabinoid receptor, right? The opiate receptors are in your brainstem, right? The cannabinoid receptors are everywhere else in your brain, not in your brainstem. So no matter how high you get on the weed, no matter how much of it you ingest, you're never going to overdose, you're never going to die, you're never going to stop breathing because it just doesn't impact the body in the same way. And really starting to understand that the chemicals in the plant, all right, phytocannabinoids as we've further classified them, right, supplement the endocannabinoids in our bodies. And this whole concept of the endocannabinoid system and these compounds and the receptors and then what, they're, what are they there for? Well, they're there to create chemical balance and homeostasis, right? Walgreens, shout out, hey, right? Mm -hmm. Walgreens didn't exist back in the, in, in, in the beginning of time, right? We were put on this earth with the best pharmacy on the, on the corner in us. And then it's these nutrients and things, you know, that were designed to help us. And most of them were designed to, to come from plants, right? I mean, there's certainly the argument that uh, humanity really, like, you know, got supercharged when we started to, to eat, you know, red meat and whatnot. And, and, and I do. I own a barbecue place in New York. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm no stranger to that. But um, in the last few years, as I've become active in the cannabis movement, it's really opened my eyes to, uh, to plants and our connection uh, with them. The two crucial things you brought up there within your story, it's so important to identify how many other people as well are experiencing severe opiate addictions and also veterans that are now we're running shout out to maps, helping run really important cannabis trials. Mm -hmm. This is a new way for us to, like you said, the intent, setting intent. You mentioned this now many times. The intent to heal, the intel, intent to commune with earth and with each other. That is so precious and so important. We started talking about the, the medicinal benefits and the health and wellness now of so many people being augmented due to cannabis roaring. And we see it now across the world, slowly emerging more and more countries, more and more grows. Was just reading about tons of different countries in Africa now starting to really grow and prosper with cannabis. And I'm like, damn, nice. So tell us about your thoughts on a more abstract global level on cannabis coming in as a medicine and its impact on I don't, humanity. I don't necessarily think it's a medicine. I make a uh, correlation. Nutrient, supplement, Thank those you. were, yes. I make a, I make a correlation to, uh, to weed like water. We all know that we need to supplement our bodies with eight glasses of water every day to maintain optimal hydration. It's a well-known fact. If we overdose on water, right, that could actually kill you. <laughs> too much water too quickly, all right? That could kill you. Um, I think we need to look at weed in a similar way. I think we need to look at it as um, our bodies contain these endocannabinoids, right? What's happening is uh, you have your uh, neurotransmitters, right? And you've got synapses and they move from your presynaptic to your postsynaptic. And they move in one direction because that's from pre to post, like a one-way street, right? Endocannabinoids are actually manufactured by the postsynaptic and travel in reverse from post to pre, 
and then from pre to post. So what you have is a bi-directional communication pathway, the only one in the body. Now the science behind why the endocannabinoid system is kind of like the body's master thermostat, right, is because it can send chemical signals in both ways. A really good example of that is inflammation. Right? In my case, as a chronic pain patient, I used cannabis as an anti-inflammatory. In the case of the U.S. government, who ironically has a patent on cannabis as a neuroprotectant for traumatic brain injury, it's used in an inflammatory capacity to, as a neuroprotectant. Now, the body has the ability to uh, use these tools. So when I think of it and describe it as a supplement, right? Imagine humanity, if we were um, limited access to water, and if society at large was chronically dehydrated, how would that impact our health, right? If we stop thinking about the intention of cannabis for getting high, and we start thinking about it as a nutrient and a supplement, and preventatively, like your one a day should have low dose compounds that exist in this plant, just like iron and potassium, all these different things that our body needs. Envisioning cannabis in this way is really interesting. It's a good analogy, this nutrient supplement and being dehydrated of it across the world and then activating it. That's very cool. I like how you're bringing this up. Question interjecting is, out of the 7.7 .7 billion of us, how many do you believe need the nutrient? Because water, everyone needs. Okay, 7.7 .7 billion of us. Okay, we are made of mostly water. We are all wired for weed. We've all got an endocannabinoid system. We all require this essential nutrient, all okay, of us. So, so some of us may require maybe a milligram or two I'm a talking day. the lowest dose. The lowest dose. Without the intention of being high. With the intention of nutrient supplement. Correct. Interesting, okay. <clears throat> and this is yeah. not just humans. Animals? This is all vertebrates. Interesting. And this goes back to the beginning of time to like sea squirts, right? The evidence of endocannabinoids and endocannabinoid receptors goes back to the beginning of life itself. That's what's up. Interesting. I wonder how many um, other scientists, first of all, I'd like to have more, um, a couple more interviews with endocannabinoid specific scientists of the system in the body. Um, two, I wonder how many scientists slash just people in general would be, um, would slightly p refute that all 7.7 .7 billion need even a, 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 mil, a milligram or two uh, per day. So. Interesting that that's, that that's a perspective. Yeah. I'm not a scientist, and I tend to regurgitate information that seems logical and makes sense to me. Um, you should look up a gentleman named Dr. Bob Melamede. Okay. okay. He's amazing. He was one of the first guys on YouTube that like, I learned about this stuff from. He is a, he's got a few letters after his name. He's a, I believe he's a, a, a chemist or biologist mm -hmm. or you know he as you know with your boy he's you're I'm, I'm already gonna reach out tonight via email and hopefully Dude, tell Dr. It. Bob Dr. Bob Melody. Pinsky Pinsky says what's up the Pinsky says what's up you could also reach out to uh, Dr. Ethan Russo okay, okay. and uh, Russo is the one that coined this term I believe the uh, a clinical endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome very interesting endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome that's so interesting for me to poke at with a scientific prod and just try and understand that better because i don't necessarily know how many scientists even know about this think about it as a deficient a nutrient deficiency then people don't when out of the people that walk into dispensaries when i watch them when i talk to them most people aren't coming in for a, a nutrient deficiency. Uh, the intent is not that. So I love the way that you're framing this. This is what I meant earlier talking about rewriting the narrative on cannabis to a global audience. Yes. Yes. So we, let's, okay, let's jump into this because you are rewriting the cannabis narrative to a global audience. And you're doing that with ease. Ease is doing it 
as facilitating the access to this nutrient. And then with uh, Bong Appetit, you're rewriting the cannabis narrative to a global audience through media. So let's talk about, let's talk about those two. Let's break them down. The uh, intention on Bong Appetit was a cooking show that was cooking with cannabis. Right? We didn't know going in that we were going to create something that was going to uh, rewrite the narrative on weed itself. And I think the formula for success on that, again, which just kind of happened, we never set out with the intention of saying we need to do a show that's going to have all this amazing undertone that's going to make families connect from parents to children, that's going to portray this in such a great light. We never knew the net result of what was going to come out of it until it happened. And when you're creating something from nothing, I mean, that's very often that that happens in creation. Totally. My role on the show as cannabis producer was uh, behind the scenes, though there is one episode of me donning Penske's glasses and the, uh, the bathrobe in our pothead sleepover. <laughs> really funny. We all got together and watched like Reefer Madness and ate brownies. We were like the antithesis of like, we're not going to do a show that's cookies and brownies. That story's been told. You know, when I first sat down with the executive producer's advice, I came in with a chemistry set full of cannabis stuff. And they're like, Pinsky, no way, man. Like, this is never going to translate. Like, we're not doing a science show. We're doing a food show. It's part of Viceland's, uh, part of Vice's Munchies vertical. It's food focused. And, uh, and I think it was a, it was a little uh, bold, but I was like, guys, look, you guys have an obligation at Vice not to tell the same story. Yeah. How many people are cooking with weed butter and, you know, we have an opportunity to talk about like all these new products, all these new methods of extraction, all this new product development, these textures, these finishes, and then when you take the plant and you refine it to the traditional hash that everyone knows, the Lebanese and like what you can get in Amsterdam back in the 80s and 90s and still today, right? Which is a primitive mechanical separation style, okay? And you further refine that into what we refer to as concentrates or extracts and then all the different textures and finishes, butters, rosins, dabs, shatter, you know, all these concentrated forms, right? And then you further refine that into the oil that we see in vape pens and you further take that and distill it and you take this like cannabis oil and you pull it apart and then you just have all these uh, isolated compounds. Your THC is over here and your CBD is over here. But what you have is this multitude of fragrance compounds that are in the plant, the terps, the terpenes, yep. right? And that to me is really the, uh, the most interesting part. Right? For me, uh, and that's what really translates to food. Because now what we can do is we can uh, create a pantry, a palette, so to speak, of new ingredients. Right? What happens when Picasso gets like a whole new paint set? Right? This was the uh, genesis of what we tried to capture on the show. We would not let these chefs in the pantry, and we would not choose chefs that were cannabis savvy. Right? We wanted iron chefs, master chefs. We wanted to capture that aha genesis moment. That's what's translating to the audience. When you at home see someone having that experience of newness, discovery, these are the things that it takes to rewrite the narrative. Right? And then to be able to say to a chef, okay, this is just the THC. You could make your dish you could use all your flavor profiles, THC isolate has no flavor or fragrance. So you could just add a little bit of the medicinal or the euphoric to your creation. Then we say, hey, this is our terpene section. All these different fragrances, they have no psychoactive effect. You could pair them with your food. This is our CBD area. This is no psychoactivity. You know, I mean, there's now a whole new thinking perspective, if you will, yeah. on how to use this plant. Okay. And the difference between fractioning it off and using it in all these, you know, these vape pens that you see on the market these days, 
are distil distilled THC with different flavor profiles, some that come from the plant and some that come from other flavor sources. Okay. And when you think about that and the intention that most people are using that for, which is to get high, right? Um, you miss the opportunity for the most therapeutic impact. The best therapy from the plant comes from what we refer to as whole plant medicine. Mm -hmm. When you extract all the compounds from the plant and you ingest that, that's the type of plant medicine that is switching on the body's natural mechanism to take cells that are damaged and shut them off. Right? That process you can check with your scientist friends. Mm -hmm. It's called apoptosis. Mm -hmm. right? People used to use cannabis in a way that was like more of a reactionary, right? Uh, cancer, AIDS, right? Um, you're gonna get a prescription for weed, it's gonna help with your appetite and nausea. Why? Because smoking weed is a very primitive delivery. And whereas there's like a cannabis, uh, a THC could be in its isolated form as 100% pure THC. When you're ingesting it uh, via smoking it via joint, 5%, 10%, right? So this is what happened with me in my medical journey was the uh, product development of these, taking it from the plant and making all these products that we started to use on Bong Appetit, right? Um, because of the advancement in uh, science, analytics, being able to break down the compounds in the plant and report on that. Now breeders are able to like breed up certain cannabinoids, breed down others. This was the uh, roadmap for the hemp movement, uh, the, uh, the CBD movement. It was all because analytics were able to allow people to breed low THC cannabis, which qualifies as hemp under the farm bill. Newsflash, okay? They're smoking weed. They're growing weed, man, okay? <laughs> That's the newsflash. But it qualifies as um, hemp because of the amount of THC that's in it, and most of those varieties are high in CBD. And we were able to breed like that because we had the testing and the analytics, yes. right, to be able to see what was in it. But really, at the end of the day, the most therapeutic uh, impact from the plant comes from all of the compounds working synergistically together. Okay, so a couple things. First, I love how you m made the push for the media that you're producing with Bong Appetit to be more, at least a little bit scientific, more scientific, because you have, an, you have an obligation to communicate a new narrative, that new narrative being this whole plant as a supplement, as a mm -hmm. nutrient. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanna, and you also uh, identified and articulated the nuance that we can now with the, again, we talked about that exponential technology hockey stick, we can break down cannabinoids to a new degree, to the nuance of terpenes, to the nuance of all the different cannabinoid profiles, mm -hmm. and, and play with food with that, which is super exciting, and see which properties are actually going to be best for our own health and wellness keep in, in, in use. Keep in mind, that represented 10% of the show. Exactly. And so, so, this is, so this is the point, and just to bring you full triangle, so to speak. Bang Appetit was a success because it was authentic to the core community who already had the legacy and who really wanted to see the advancement of the products, but it was palatable to a mainstream audience through food. So everyone eats food. So because we really put ourselves forward as a food-focused show, that was the main ingredient, that was the main thing that translated to a global audience because everybody eats, okay? The cannabis story, which was underlying, okay, was authentic because we were telling the story of the advancement in product development through science and whatnot. Yeah. 
Now that is, you know, you, you mentioned here, I wanna just hear your thoughts on this before as we move into how you're doing similar with, work with, with ease on the whole plant as a nutrient supplement side of things. This has now been, this is talked about at New West Summit, this is talked about by Mara Gordon and so many other leaders that the whole plant is the medicine, is the supplement, the nutrient. Teach us about that. Well, there's about 400 chemical compounds in the plant, right? Some of them are like the, uh, the plant material itself, right? But when you do an extraction, right, you're, uh, you're taking out all these cannabinoids and all these terpenes and they work in a synergistic uh, f uh, function with one another. Um, Raphael Meshulam uh, and uh, what's the name of the guy who did the, uh, the CNN, Sanjay Gupta, right? They referred to it uh, on weeds, right? Uh, uh, weed 1.0, weed 2.0, remember that stuff? Mm -hmm. 2012, 13, it was like, whoa, uh, Sanjay Gupta, CNN media. is like, yeah, oh yeah. my God. Yeah, oh my God. You've heard of this concept called the entourage effect. Mm -hmm. Um, think of it like a rock band or think of it like a symphony. Interesting. Right? Like, okay. so like, you know, like, you know, THC is like the lead guitar, man. It's like Garcia, right? He's out front. <laughs> Fat man's getting it. You know what I mean? But like, you're not going to be the Grateful Dead without like all of the dudes in the band. Yeah. Uh, I like to refer to, uh, to cannabis as like, uh, remember that old Cheech and Chong movie? where they're actually driving a, uh, a vehicle made of weed and the tailpipe catches on fire and the whole thing starts to... <laughs> so if you think of weed like a car, right? A THC, right, is uh, like the, uh, the gas pedal, right? And then the terpenes are like your steering wheel. And they work synergistically with one another, right? The terpenes essentially steer the direction of your high, okay? So these days, uh, indica, sativa, right? These notions are, uh, are, are being debunked, right? Indica meaning a, uh, uh, the region of the plant that it was origin from, India, where there's a lot of sun and these plants grow short and stocky and sativas usually stretch up to the sky and they're grown in the mountains where like, you know, they, where there's less, you know, where the plant needs to get more gnarly and, you know, it just so happened that the shape of those plants and the terpene profiles that were associated with those plants, a sativa would give you that up and an indica would give you that, that down. But now through analytics and lab testing and looking at these different varieties and then also looking at the terpene profiles, it turns out that it's these fragrance compounds in conjunction with the THC that are really steering the direction of your high. It's not the shape of the leaf of the plant that determines how it makes you feel. And then the other variable that's really interesting is us, okay? We are the variable. Mm -hmm. Our DNA, our physiology. I'll smoke uh, some weed and it'll make me feel the same weed. And it makes me feel different than you. Well, we're different, mm -hmm. right? So now you've got like, uh, you know, groups that are like, taking your DNA and uh, starting to associate that, right? So your DNA and your body composition, we have other groups that are taking the DNA from the plant itself, right? How many versions of sour diesel are out there, <laughs> right? So like, you know, we are cloning plants, like that's acceptable. So we're cloning plants, but still, like now you might have the same genetics, but then you've got different nutrients You've got different sun, you've got different lighting variables, all these different things. Yep. So getting consistency in this is really difficult. And there's two ways to do it. You can grow the plant and then try to extract the oil and the medicine from the plant and then come up with a product. That's why people are isolating and distillating and then taking all these things and trying to make their own formulations. Then you have other dudes that are like growing cannabinoids on like yeast. In like, so when pharma comes into this, right, they're not going to be growing fields of weed and waiting three months for plants to mature and then extracting those and hoping they're able to isolate all these compounds. They're just going to start with, they're going to grow THC. Mm -hmm. in a, in, in, in a, and these things can already be done. They haven't been done in scale. 
as you see the uh, transition uh, into uh, a cannabis medicine. And um, it's interesting because pharma will quite often try to take something in nature and synthesize it and own it and patent it. And, um, and, and one compound at that. Cannabis working symbiotically, synergistically with all these compounds that are in the plant makes it a little harder to own that type of IP. You, when you mentioned the, the symphony, that was very interesting, that that's where the whole plant nutrient kicks in as a whole symphony, as an entourage, and then you also brought us to the, <laughs> the, the gas pedal and the, and the steering wheel for the THC and the terpenes. I thought that was very interesting. These are good analogies to get people thinking in new ways and innovative ways around cannabis. Again, and changing the narrative, it's very beautiful. The new involvement um, and the new innovations that come from the phar pharma jumping in, um, potentially big alcohol and big tobacco maybe jumping in, etc. What's going to spur us creative from, from Israel and from Africa and from different areas around the world will be also very interesting to, to dive in. All right, Pinsky, we got to hear about this. So you're also facilitating the nutrient access of cannabis through ease on demand correct ease uh well first of all let me just say this that the underlying story that we're providing access to this plant medicine is not how we market is not how cannabis brands market themselves it's not how ease markets ourself um, what is ease ease is the marketplace that um, and the ecosystem that's what we create we create the software the tools and uh, through our partnerships with retailers and with product manufacturers, right, we have all, th all of us collectively create this environment and with customers, right? So customers come onto a, a menu on their phone at ease.com and they are shown uh, products that are relevant to their location. Um, so what we do is we work with cannabis licensed brands to bring their products onto our menu and into the marketplace. And then we work with retailers. And those retailers are the, and the transactions happening between the customer and the retailer, it's just happening within our marketplace. Very marketplace ecosystem. So Ease essentially is uh, facilitating on-demand cannabis. And, uh, and it's really a beautiful thing, man. I mean, like, you know, in some cases you can get a delivery of weed in six minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, right? I mean, there's really uh, the fact that cannabis became the first product that you can get in that short of a time frame is awesome. It is, yeah. Damn, that is the future of being able to get on-demand products and especially when it's a nutrient, you would like it in a short bit of time. Well, look, I mean, people aren't thinking of it like I'm, I'm preaching this gospel of it being a nutrient. I like and that. that's like the foundation. It's like uh, the uh, solfeggio scale, right? So like the nutrient story is like 174 hertz, man. It's like <laughs> it's below your root chakra, okay? It's like the one that you don't even know about. But like it's the foundation of everything else that's happening. Right? The narrative in the story is not like we're providing essential nutrients to humanity. <laughs> right? That's what's happening. Yeah. Right? Dennis Perone said it well. He said there's no such thing as, a, as recreational use. It's all medicinal use. Mm -hmm. No matter what your intention is, you are actually helping your body by supplementing it with these compounds that exist in our bodies naturally. Uh, so Ease, you know, we really are, uh, I'm the chief cannabis evangelist at Ease. But really at the end of the day, I don't think of myself as an evangelist for Ease. Definitely an evangelist for cannabis. Ease, yeah. ease happens to be, and that's what we want. We want to, we want to highlight cannabis. We want to highlight the, uh, the, brand, the brands and the products. Right? And that's what's so interesting about this industry right now. Right? What we're really talking about is broccoli. Okay? Cannabis is and will continue to be and will be more obviously seen as a commodity. 
cost of production will go down. Lettuce, dude. That's what this is. How cheap is a head of lettuce? There's no value to it, practically. And if I look at my history in, right, but there is value to the brands, right? Like you're buying commodity products based on the trust that you have for the brand that is associated with that product. Look, I watched this happen in technology, man. I used to be in the tech business. I used to create software. Then we got into internet. Then we got into hosting and email and web and all these different things that I was able to charge hundreds of dollars a month, man. I used to charge 25 bucks a month per mailbox, right? Then all of a sudden, Google came around and all these different brands came around. And then it was like, we're gonna give away the technology for free but you're gonna take our brand name and use it in your email address. And so what's happening in the cannabis industry right now is the cost of the weed is just continuing to go down and down and down. So creating your brand is actually of a high value, pun intended, right? And uh, that's what I think is happening here at Ease. And this is why I wanna be able to work with content Right, Bong Appetit was really special because it gave cannabis brands an opportunity to be featured on the world stage. Mm -hmm. What it lacked was the opportunity for the people watching to get access to those products. At a click of a button that's supporting Just even in general. That brand. Even in general. Man, Bong Appetit may have been Fantasy Island, right? It may have been The Bachelor. It was something that was happening in California in a moment of time where we were able to shoot that show. But like even the people watching, the broad scale of them were unable to get the products that they saw on the show, right? Because they were not necessarily available in the marketplace because they were, man, we were isolating. You're, you're seeing these THC diamonds and crystals and that's not on retail shelves at the dispensary, right? So. We had an opportunity to have great brand exposure on the show. We helped to build and create brands. Yeah. Okay, but what's happened is retail has gone from brick and mortar to mail order with the invention of the internet and now is moving toward on demand, mm -hmm. right? Consumers want products on demand. Consumers want ride share on demand. Consumers want media on demand, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, Ease is filling that void. And really the reason why I think it's so interesting to be able to create content that features products and then move into a new phase where we are creating a menu that allows those products to get, right? How do we take that full triangle, Yep. right? So this is really my new role at Ease. It's creating content that features products that are on our menu that you can get on demand. Mm -hmm. And you know, you mentioned retail. I mean, this game changes retail because these products are weed today in the delivery environment, vehicle is ease, but that lends itself toward other content featuring other products that people can get. So the fact, again, that cannabis becomes the um, product that really sets the stage for game changing and disrupting retail, right? Product placement is cool. Product placement is cool. Product placement is cool. But product placement fulfillment on demand is really cool. Really cool. That's the triangle with the fulfillment. I like that. And I want to touch on this as is important. You, you, we, you mention this as a, a, a broccoli, a lettuce, and I want to know more so on the intent side. You've mentioned intent several times. This is really important. The intent taken in as a nutrient or a supplement, as Perone said, is very holistic. It feels, it feels good. It feels right. At the same time, where there's a couple things here there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of like an escapist culture happening at times 
Uh, I have this is so hard. There's so much work to do. Well, I'm just smoke, chill, order food, whatever. Then there's also what age do we allow this at? There's a big age question going on. Some scientists are urging us to postpone use until 21 and later. Tell us about the, both a little on the escapism, a little on the youth. I can speak to both greatly because I used OxyContin as a escape tool to escape a reality that I was not happy with. I used gaming as an escape tool, right? To enter into multiple uh, multiplayer uh, MMO, uh, massive multiplayer online role-playing games, right? I spent a decade deep in Azeroth, right? You know what that means, if you know what that means. Mm -hmm. Azeroth is the, uh, is, is where World of Warcraft happens. So I know about escape, and I know about using weed, and I know about using Oxycontin, I know about using virtual environments that are immersive to escape. Totally. You know that if you take a plant, cannabis plant, and you eat it raw, right? Even just the leaves, not even the buds. Right? You ever hear the cannabis juicing is like the new superfood? <laughs> cannabis leaves are the new kale, right? THC in its raw form is called THCA. It's non-psychoactive, doesn't get you high, amazing as a nutrient for the body, okay? So if the intention is to use cannabis that has been bred for high THC with the intention of getting high and combustion is never a good idea, smoking, right? And so smoking weed is a certainly a primitive way, but if you look at civilizations, going back to the beginning of time, that have been using cannabis in their food source, China, India, right? Look at the, uh, the lost tribes, the lost tribe of Jews that became the Rastafarians. That is a star of David, dude, right? It's been a long-standing relationship between Jews and weed that goes back to the beginning of time, but even before that, Indians, bongs, bong, charis, right? All these different preparations. China, right? China did not only use cannabis for bowstrings and industrial applications. If you look up the first entheogenic use of a plant, in China, these dudes were buried with like weed as like this sacrament, right? It's like this holy plant, right? So when you think of civilizations, you ever see a Rastafarian Jamaican dude that's like 100 years old and that guy is built like an ox and still could run 100 miles? You know that dude has been eating weed his whole life? Potentially through other sources such as the cannabis leaf as kale could, could, uh, could be consumed in, in salad type. It will be interesting to understand and better study the use for, um, for both intent for, for as a supplement nutrient rather than escape, as well as um, for youth and approximately um, what the benefits are. And keep if there keep are in downsides. mind, okay, the difference between THCA and THC. THCA is non-psychoactive because it's THC with a carboxylic acid chain on the end of the molecule. And because it's got that carboxylic acid chain, it can't penetrate the blood-brain barrier, it doesn't enter the bloodstream. Therefore, it's non-psychoactive. Yeah. Okay, when the plant is growing, it's growing THCA. THC is a byproduct, it breaks, as THC breaks down, that carboxylic acid either it, you know, breaks down through heat. At high heat, it will break down instantly. At room temperature, there's a curve and it breaks down slowly over time. And that's what we call activating. Activating it. Interesting, the use of THCA as a non psychoactive If you eat the plant yeah. raw, you get all these amazing nutrient benefits from it. You don't get high. Non-psychoactive benefits. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good points, good points. Um, okay, I want to talk about markets. This is really important. Uh, this is being quoted to be a multi-hundred billion dollar, if not trillion dollar industry over the next century. And that the United States in many ways has 
taken a back seat to other powers like the United Kingdom, Israel, the Netherlands, Africa. This is Canada. And what co sense? companies Backseat. going public, companies going public on the Canadian Stock Exchange. Israel having the, the growing cannabis at the highest qualities at less than 15 bucks an ounce. 60 cents a gram. Commodity. A commodity. And so. Broccoli. Broccoli. So the United States here and California, through all of its hard work of pushing the narrative forward and making it happen, has again an obligation on a national scale to prioritize the legalization of cannabis for the nutritional, the supplemental purpose for humans, not only in the US but around the world, and also to advance innovation of some of the most creative people in the world to be able to innovate and create within the cannabis industry publicly as it being legal. So I want to hear your thoughts on the markets. I think that the uh, intent, intention behind lawmakers has nothing to do with the nutritional value of the plant. But one can see a direct effect of lawmakers helping legalize means more access. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But the intention is money. You're seeing this happen on a broad scale where politicians who have careers against this plant are leaving office, joining companies. All of a sudden things are becoming legal. I watched this happen in New York State. New York State, you have five companies that got awarded licenses. You know the companies that got awarded licenses, built the New York State Thruway, ran the electrical contracts on Staten Island. We're like, you know, like, come on, dude. Look at what's actually going on. So there's two, there's two sides to this story, right? There's the market and the movement, right? Ease operates on both sides of the coin. We have an entire company, we have an entire staff within our organization that is dealing with research, public policy, advancing legislation that has nothing to do with our core business, social impact, right? All of these different things that represent the movement. So you have the movement and pushing the movement forward and then you have the market and the money and the profit and all these things. And personally, I try to speak more toward the movement, right? I recently had a psychedelic experience where I was asking myself a really important question about my purpose. I'm like, man, what is my purpose in this? Like I'm part of this movement, I'm part of this company Ease, you know, can be perceived as big weed, right? Perception is really important. And then myself and my authentic self, my quest and my intention, and then also co-branding with this company, right? it really made me ask myself like, okay, dude, <laughs> what is my purpose? Like, what am I trying to do? Like, what's the bigger picture outside of like my job here and creating content and like for what? Am I trying to affect change? Am I trying to make profit? Am I trying to make profit or am I trying to affect change? Man, this was a, uh, this was like a, uh, a question that really burned within me. And uh, what I realized, uh, was that sometimes you have to make profit to effect change. That is correct. I'm glad that that was the realization. So when one is able to come from the soul as I care most about the movement, that is what I care most about. I care about the movement towards a unity on this planet moving yeah. forward. That that's what I care about most. At the same time, I understand that I can make steps, greater steps towards that unity as we build things of value into yeah, the world correct. that then can help move the movement forward. 
Yep, I'm glad that, that you're there. And so that's one of the reasons why I do think that the United States picking up its getting a little fire under its butt to, to move forward in the legalization will help advance the movement. Well, I will say this. You know, you saw Amsterdam um, in terms of the uh, recreational marketplace, right, since the late 80s, coffee shops. My first cannabis cup competition was in 1994. I was 21 years old, okay? And shout out to High Times for creating media that has really been pushing the envelope and telling the story. And, you know. Um, Shout out to also Jim McAlpine with 420 games. No, all of it. Things like that. Yeah, exactly. All of the, the, uh, all of the uh, amazing humans, if that is in fact what we are. <laughs> yeah. Human animals and whatever's coming through that. Uh, well, I know. That's <laughs> coming. That's coming shortly. That's actually. We're getting there. We're getting there shortly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are so many amazing souls that are collectively pushing this movement forward. And it stems not only from people who uh, create communities or venues, but really uh, all of the... Uh, people that grow the plant, that process the plant. Uh, now you're starting to see a convergence of the uh, legacy community and the, uh, the new, uh, some people refer to as green rushers. Here's the thing, man. The legacy community needs the new community, the business community, the financial community, mm -hmm. the legislative community, the investment community, you know? This is why I saw such an opportunity at Ease because most of the professionals we have here within this organization are professionals in their respective fields. And this is why the target audience for me in the year and a half that I've been here has been the staff first. Because it was important to me to make sure that everyone who was expert in all these things that it takes to build and create a business and to fuel an industry, right? We're authentically uh, rooted, pun intended, right? With uh, knowledge. That's right. right. Education is always at the forefront. You know what the Wachungs are? Wachungs? Wachung. Wachung. The Wachungs are the rock formations in New Jersey, right? That uh, Route 280, right? Route 280 wasn't built around the Wachungs. Route 280 went through the Wachungs, right? When you're carving a new path, mm -hmm. that's what I feel like my experience has been, like the mm -hmm. Wachungs. That's right, that's right. right. You're, you're first, it's explosive. You have to blast through that rock, and then you have to lay a foundation, and then you have to build a road, and then you watch as civilization travels on that road. That is very beautifully said, and I think that may be the divine purpose of so many of us beings on this planet, is to do exactly that. That is, uh, that is so gorgeous. We, we must, it's our obligation to create these roads that civilization can advance on through our hard work of making it happen. And that is a lot of what actualization is all about. Okay. This is something that we've been talking about a lot. It's really important to, to address how to best handle this. There seems to be a strong, good way of looking at this is a, is a, a topology, a topology of influence, a topology of clout. And as you start laying, you blast through that rock, you start laying the, the road, you gain further and further up on this topology. And more and more people, the network continues to build, especially once the road is laid out and people are civilization starting to go down it, more and more connections, more and more network effect is going on. It's, it's difficult to figure out how to maximize efficiencies with networks. We see a lot of times people get dragged 
out of their most efficient habits by going into areas of their network that may not be as effective as, as if they kept climbing and kept reaching out to more and more diverse areas on the top of these topologies. So, thoughts on this network effect and network theory? Have you heard of the Pinsky Triangle? <laughs> so, please explain the Pinsky mm. Triangle. <laughs> Uh, for me, it's uh, it start well. There are many faces. It's three dimensional. It's actually a four point geometric figure. It's a tetrahedron, okay, and uh, and we can talk in terms of my career triangle to start, right? Media, food, tech, weed, as we talked about in the show open today. In the 90s, I was connecting the dots. What we do in life is we establish these points, okay? For me, it was media, started with music, okay? Weed and tech. In the 90s, somehow I was able to connect the dots. And really, uh, um, you know, I worked in uh, technology at a software company, okay? At night, I would record music, live music, and through that music community, forged a lot of relationships. Uh, with uh, cannabis cultivators and, you know, cannabis and, and music were kind of like my uh, passion points. And then tech was how I made my living. And then over the course of my career, food came into the equation. You know, in the 90s, it was like uh, people often not only establish these points, but then connecting the dots, okay, is everything. And um, back in the day, it was music and weed. Music and weed is an easy connection, right? And then uh, tech, right? I couldn't really, really go forward with the weed thing because in 1994, 93, it was like illegal, right? So then music and tech became the two points that I was connecting, right? But music and tech and weed, and then I really started to propel my career in that geometry. And then 15 years later, I added food and I opened up a restaurant in Brooklyn, and then the triangle shifted. And then as uh, time went on, cannabis now, instead of tech, became at the top point. And really, I had kind of gotten out of the tech space, but I stayed in media and food, and that really led to the genesis of Bong Appetit. Bong Appetit connected weed and media and food, and went full triangle once again. Mm -hmm. And then that brought me out to California. And here I am in California and I'm looking at the industry and somehow I met these guys here at Ease. And I was like, oh, media, food, weed. Well, tech was my past life. Yep. Man, what would happen if I connected the dots of media, food, tech, and weed? Not just three connections, but four. And that's when it went from three-point geometry to four-point geometry to sacred geometry. And what I realized was that community is the thread that connected the dots on the Pinsky Triangle mm -hmm. for all of us. Coming out here to California and immersing myself in this community, not operating from New York from the sidelines and kind of living in a cave, but being that Leo and being fierce on the top of the mountain and being like, yeah, dude, Right? We're in this. We're in this in media. We're in this in tech. Right? What I realized was that um, we've all got Pinsky triangles, man. You might not refer to it as your Pinsky triangle. Right? But when I take mine and I connect it to yours and the next person who's doing this great work in the movement and this guy who's created this great company and this guy and all these women who are like pushing this in movement forward all these amazing people, right? When we connect our triangles together, that's when it goes from three-point geometry to four-point geometry to sacred geometry, and that's when the triangle goes fractal, okay? So this was my experience. I'm sitting here at dinner, October 2017, same conversation, and the person at the table next to me is like, have you ever Googled the words triangle and fractal? Knew that my last name was Pinsky. Man, you Google triangle and fractal. Try this at home. Type it in. Triangle, fractal. 
What's it called? It's called the Serpinski Triangle, dude. This is the guy who created the concept of the triangular fractal is like my namesake. Close enough. Mm -hmm. And then I'm having my moment where I'm like, this is divine. This is bigger than me. Like, that can't be a coincidence. And then I think to myself, like, uh, you know, this is my moment. Like, in <clears throat> life, you know, about finding your purpose. Serpinski, right? Who else is like a sir? How about Sir Alec Guinness, Obi-Wan Kenobi? How about Sir Patrick Stewart, Jean-Luc Picard? Like, these are my heroes, man. Like, love you, Sir Richard Branson, but like, you're not Obi-Wan or Picard, dude, right? <laughs> and this is when I realized that I was like, maybe like, you know, looking at things in this sacred geometry. I got out to California and I started to really, you know, kind of, uh, totally forgot the question you asked me, by the way. Well, you did start um, hitting on it in, an, in, an, in the lens that I thought was quite interesting. It's that when we are, do, you know, you illustrate your own Pinsky triangle and your own way of connecting really important fields that you're passionate about to community. other, yeah, yeah community. the community, to other people's, again, fullest actualization. They've identified their most passionate fields and they've connected them, connecting to yours, connecting to others, making that Serpinski fractal. And that speaks to what the question that I asked because you gotta really work in understanding network theory, understanding influence and impact and finding these nodes that you wanna plug yourself to as you keep climbing up, keep plugging yourself into higher and higher mentorships and more and more people from diverse um, topology heads that you can work with. And so by doing that, you can advance your path path that you're paving, that road that you're paving, and letting civilization go down. So it. here's what I commonly say in terms of the community. Man, I don't know who I know anymore. This is, goes hand in hand with saying, what was the question? And this is how we met, right? Having some sort of uh, tech that can help to lay out this amazing community, not only in cannabis, but in terms of the people that we know, right? Relationships are at the core. Trusted relationships are at the core, yeah. okay? Yeah. So like, this is a problem that I have had over time, 25 years, four different careers. Every single one of these points has their own really powerful trusted network of relationships I don't know who I know anymore. Not only that, but if I knew who I knew and algorithms could help me make proper introductions to accelerate their roads that they are paving, that would be fantastic. So yeah, we're working on this. We're working on some stuff in this, in this field. This is really important. Okay, these couple quick simulation questions on the way out. All right, what would you say is a core driving principle of yours? like my uh, core driving principle or like uh, core value? Sure. Uh, well, this is the, uh, by the way, the triangle is now re been renamed. It's called the triangle formerly known as the Pinsky Triangle. This is what happens in every hero's journey as you experience the ego death, right? What I realized is that a lot of my narrative and the reason why I bring this up in relation to your question of core values is because before the career triangle, before the triangle of trust, there was my core values. Mm -hmm. As I'm sitting, recovering, 2012, knowing that I was gonna have to make a shift in my career, thinking it was gonna go in a different direction, after 20 some odd years in business, I asked myself, well, what has worked for me and what hasn't? What was important to me? If I'm gonna reinvent myself or move into a different chapter or evolve into a higher consciousness or whatever was gonna happen that I didn't know was gonna happen, what did I need to maintain? Well, passion. Let's start with that. You better love what you do, dude. Right, for me, 
in 25 years in work, I had peaks and valleys in passion. I had times in my career where I was so passionate about my work that it didn't feel like work. I had other times in my career where my life and expenses and just maintaining, right, required higher incomes with less passion. Could breed an environment where someone would want to escape with Oxycontin and Warcraft. Okay, so passion, boom. And for me, it was the next thing, which was what I thought was like, this is when the ego is high. I want to be the CEO. I want to be passionate for what I do, and I need to call the shots. This was the uh, 2013 version of my core values triangle. As that evolved, I realized that maybe it's not that I need to call the shots because if I want to be the boss, well, that limits the opportunity I have and the people I could work with. And so maybe what I need to do is I need to like make sure if I'm going to be part of a bigger, larger organization that I'm able to like kind of beat to my own drum. Mm -hmm. And it was the rhythm. And then that changed to what I now refer to as inner voice. Right? In life, we have people around us, whether it's our friends, spouses, parents, right, that are trying to impose their voice on your path. And um, it takes a lot of self-confidence to be able to make your inner voice speak loudest. For me, in 2013, my inner voice was telling me, dude, you're six months away from turning 40. If you don't lose 100 pounds and get 100% off these pain meds that you've been on for 12 years, you are not going to make it to 50. Talk about connecting the dots of passion, inner voice. What was the passion for? Life, bro. Right? I was like looking for what my next gig was going to be. And I decided to make my full-time job me and my health. Mm -hmm. and that was the basis of why I was like, okay, man, I've tried to lose weight as I've started 16 businesses. I've tried to get off these medications as I've tried to be an entrepreneur. And the business needs to be me. And that was only possible because I had 20 years of foundation and was able to like not have to be the slave to going into a job for a paycheck and crafted a life where I was able to focus on my food, my health. And interestingly enough, I'm not going to let you just leave this gaming conversation as an escape thing because the dedication and the discipline and the motivation and the enthusiasm that I got from this uh, online gaming environment. And you have facets of community, and you have facets of, you know, projecting there, yourself into as, as this other character. There this are whole other experience. cognitive benefits that have been logged about games, totally. But what I did was I gamified my life. I took the concept of leveling up my character, and I said, man, if I could level 10 tunes to max level as a progression raider, in World of Warcraft. You can level up in the real world. Fuck yeah, man. Yeah, I love it. I love so it. I gamified my weight loss and my opiate reduction. Love it. Literally. I started to set apps on my phone, timers, that would time my intake of medication so I could slowly taper off. I joined Weight Watchers, which assigned point values to food and allowed me a certain value every day and started logging my intake. I used apps from pharmacies to as pill reminders and you know, I absolutely gamified my experience of losing weight and tapering off opiates to level up my life. Yep. And it's so interesting now as that translates to cannabis. Right? Education is at the core of changing the hearts and minds of humanity, advancing this movement. Where's the incentive? I mean, in Warcraft, the incentive was 
not only leveling up your character and getting legendary weapons and all this kind of like gear, but really it was, it was based in the lore, right? They had developed such compelling IP and characters. Mm. Tolkien did the same thing, Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings. Yeah, Harry Potter, Rowling. All did. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So the depth of the story and the advancement of the story and not being able to move through the story unless you leveled up your character to move into different zones where you could further the thing. Which is your life in this way. You want to get to 50, you want to be able to continue doing your creative splash of, of painting this road and constructing this road. This brings me into uh, the gamification of cannabis. I believe we have an opportunity to gamify consumption as cannabis turns into a commodity, right? Just like media turned into a commodity and then what did you have? You had Netflix that came in with this subscription model and all these cable systems and HBO and all this content that's by subscription, not, not by content. Music, Spotify, Apple Music, right? So I believe that there needs to be an incentive for consumers to come to Ease or anywhere on a daily basis and get educated. What's that education incentive? It could be unlocking a new product in the menu. All right, what's that? What are you leveling up? I mean, like we are lacking right now in terms of our uh, community within the cannabis community, within the ecosphere of, of ease. Gaming and gaming communities have been integral in that. So I see a future where consumers can come to ease and be given a daily quest, just like in Warcraft. And that daily quest uh, could be like anything from consume this product, which is low dose and healthy for you, but more importantly is like, sign up a friend to vote. Go to this legislative hearing, right? Pokemon took the gaming landscape and put it on the map. Mm -hmm. We're here at Venice, man. They've got these scooters, birds, limes. Mm -hmm. That's gamification of transportation, man. Just like in game, you have a resource, you get on a ride, you're like, boom. So it's the same concept of like taking the game field and extending that into, into here. Yeah, that's exciting to send people on quests to do things that further increase their awareness. That's interesting. That's how stuff. you level up. That's how you level up. So this, is, this brings us to the collective consciousness. I don't want to take you off path from your questioning, but it's important that through that process of living in virtual game environments and then to and that process of taking the gaming environment and now taking it from within the computer and extending it onto the landscape and fabric of our reality. And then taking also the concept of fractals and how things are just repeating versions of themselves in nature, you know. How do you connect the dots? Well, I've recently heard about this concept of our higher selves. And how... Uh, you know, our consciousness, right? I think of our consciousness and the expansion of our consciousness, right? People in the beginning of time had basically two states. You had your awake state and your sleeping state. And your consciousness moved between them. And as technology advanced, think of how many different virtual states, right? How many suspended states of consciousness do you have in every email, text message, right? For me, as a, uh, as a chronic pain patient, I was in a waking dream state, opiate state, right? So I believe that our consciousness moves between all these different. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is like humanity, and this is deep, dude, right? I want you to know that I'm not attached to this as what I think is going on. I'm open-minded to the possibility that this might be what's going on, mm -hmm. right? I've learned to be open-minded to any and every possibility and detached from any of them, mm -hmm. okay? But like humanity is at the point right now where we are creating these virtual environments inside of our computers, mm -hmm. and then we are controlling versions of ourselves. Our consciousness moves from our real reality 
in in game in in indistinguishable environment yeah yeah and what's happening is two things are happening so how is this one not already an instant distinguishable you one? know what the showcase showdown is dude in the price is right it's what happens at the end of the price is right you got to go through all of the price is right before you get to the showcase showdown dude please allow me yeah <laughs> you got enough videotape here i mean like we got plenty of tape dude you know so <laughs> Dude, please. <laughs> yes, okay? <laughs> but here's my theory on this. If you think about... <laughs> Sorry. The showcase showdown you know analogy, showcase that's showdown funny. Showdown the price is right. It's yeah. at the end yeah, yeah, of yeah. the price is right. That's funny. There's always the big reveal. It's at the end, dude. Okay, so here's we the talk about this quite a bit on the show. I'm, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. I'm uh, new to, to, uh, to, to the... Uh, Always a beginner in life, always. The beginner's mind, as it is. That's right. And uh, anyway, so what I believe is happening in this time in, in our evolved consciousness and our evolution as of humanity at large is uh, technology is allowing us to create uh, digital versions of ourselves in games, in these massive multiplayer online, they happen to be role-playing games, whatever you want to call them, but we have ourselves and then we have our digital selves. And right now, at, we're at the point where it takes us to control our digital self. You know, you're using WASD to move your character on the keyboard, plus your mouse to move your perspective on the camera, and you're moving through this virtual environment. But then what happens? Right? The evolution is that the character in-game becomes automated. It's artificial intelligence. So now instead of you having to like run to do 16 different things, you could like automate your character to go do those things. So the character gets smarter. The environment gets more realistic. Okay? Think about the evolution of that. What will happen eventually is the character will become autonomous and the environment will be indistinguishable. So now, eventually that character in game could potentially like have a sense of self, right? And then that character would like, then, then that would be the only thing. That world, that character's sense of self, that character's sense of self would not realize necessarily that it was being controlled mostly automated, but still some higher consciousness that has some sort of influence. So now take the fractal theory mm -hmm. and fractal it forward like this is our thing and this is what's happening in game. Pull it back. Right? If we all started from this oneness, if the Big Bang thing, right? If we all started from this thing and we're all expanding out, right? But we're all connected. Right, then maybe your consciousness is just moving into multiple iter fractal iterations. And we, and in our humanity, and, and what allows us to have this expanded consciousness is the realization that, holy shit, man, maybe like we're not fully in control. I mean, we are, but our if our consciousness is moving, you know, through different dimensions, I look at reality in a... Uh, like, I, I, I have a theory, again, not attached, but like we're like these uh, vibrating things, us. We're collections of organized vibrating things, right? And uh, we're like antennas and receivers. We receive vibration, we send vibration, right? The... Uh, electrical alignment of the energy and our configuration, the uh, golden ratio, right? It, uh, it means that we as an antenna are like, we're watching, we're all tuned in to reality because the vibration of everything around us in, term, in, in, in conjunction with the way we receive it. Imagine like humanity is tuned in to channel seven. That's what we're all watching. That's what this is, channel seven. Now, back in the beginning of time, right, and I'm not a yogi, and I'm not a, you know, a monk, 
right? But I, from what I think I understand, humanity, right, has been changing our vibrational frequency through things like breathing, meditation, what I refer to as primitive ways of changing your, the way you receive, rea perceive reality. Now technology is allowing for us to, you know, do that in different ways. Not necessarily through breathing, although they do have float things and vibrational tables and light things that like, you know, can all this different stuff, which is super cool. But then you have the plant. Mm -hmm. And then you have these entheogenic plants that um, can also change our frequency, right? I think of uh, uh, the next collective uh, movement, right? You know, the cannabis movement led to the cannabis industry, which leads to the psychedelics movement, which leads to the psychedelics industry, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, what's happening is like weed is like making it so that our vessel is so that our body is balanced, right? Dimethyltryptamine, right? And I don't refer to it as ayahuasca. Because ayahuasca is a primitive, you know, I've never done ayahuasca, but I've hit the DMT a lot, right? Ayahuasca, I refer to or think of it like an edible, like you're ingesting it. It's like this long journey, even psychedelics like LSD, mushrooms, right? All of these compounds that give you an extended psychedelic journey. It's very different than punching and piercing the veil of reality in 10 minutes and then returning back and having an opportunity to reflect. Mm -hmm. Same technology that's being used right now to extract THC from cannabis is being used to extract DMT from mimosa bark and from the acacia tree, mm -hmm. right? By the way, which like grows wild and natively in like you know, Israel and like in these parts of the earth where like, you know, all the old biblical stuff started to happen. So I've never really been a student of religion. i am come from a science background. What starts to happen is I get out to California and I start to really connect the dots between a lot of this mystical stuff and a lot of this science stuff. Totally. And this is really what I think is the most interesting thing to me right now is how is it that all this shit that was written down back in the day, all this sacred geometry especially, right, is uh, also, also the same geometric shapes that we're seeing in science all over the place. Um, you know, so you talk about like the correlation between, uh, between you know, science and, and mysticism and spirituality and the, the simulation. I love that this is the simulation, man. Mm -hmm. I'm totally open-minded to the concept of, uh, of us already being in it. You know, you've mm -hmm. heard a lot of provocative thought leaders also speaking to that. Absolutely. I think that's really the advantage of, uh, of my journey with, with DMT. And it does matter. We hear a lot from people on the show that it doesn't matter. No, it actually, it does matter. It's a very interesting thought experiment to calculate and open one's awareness to understanding simulation theory, understanding how you've indicated throughout the conversation, the, the indistinguishable realities. So as we play in indistinguishable realities with our characters and automate processes, when you, can, when you can hit a vape pen and hold your breath, three huge hits, hold your breath each time as long as you can, and all of a sudden you like pop the fabric of reality. The veil. You pierce the veil of reality, right? And what happens is for that short period of time, you see things in a different physics change the way things sound, the configuration of atoms, all this stuff is now you're looking at the fabric of reality, looking through the fabric of reality, right? And seeing perception and seeing things through a different lens. This is gonna get really good when we are able to completely 
map neural signatures during subjective mystical experiences and then replay them for other people. But short that, acting, short acting, yeah, transformative psychedelic experiences correct. allow us to have that journey, to step into that parallel perspective, and then we're back and then we could reflect. Totally. No disrespect to LSD, man, but it is like really confusing sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When you're like, you know, to put all these pieces together while you're like having this extended yeah. journey. Piercing the veil with a DMT quickly and then coming back. And I do like, there's, there's a serious importance with science, with, with running, with scientific method, with running hypotheses. And then, like I said, being able to display one subjective experience to other people afterward and then do that at mass scales and then say, okay, we are actually piercing a veil of reality. Look at what we're understanding now. Now we're really leveling up as a civilization. It's exciting stuff, and I like how you talked about your some of your core values being about that passion. That that straight up, you love what you do so much. Doesn't feel like work. That's a tremendously important thing to pass on to children. Um, if you could rebuild civilization from scratch, how would you design it? I would design it in a way that had a. Um, I would design a universal translator at the core. I think that the ability for us, civilization, to be able to communicate. <coughs> I think language is a, uh, and the uh, lack of one group being able to even understand. So through communication, I would have some sort of universal communication from the start. Yeah, that's a really good. That's a really good one. Communication's been something you've been referring to several times, and it's well, so not just sure. community, but communication. Like you know, yeah, communication itself. Yeah, the way that human animals communicate is a direct representation of the society that they build. Mm -hmm. So the better we communicate, the better society we build. Um, we talked a lot about this already. What exists past our three D reality, but let's uh, let's see what uh, what else do you have to add to the exist past the 3D reality? I think that past the 3D reality, I think what we don't see is we don't see, like we're communicating right now through structured vibrations through our voice. Have you seen Dune? The movie Dune? Mm, maybe. Okay, go check out Dune. Yeah, I know I'm no scientist, an endocannabinoid scientist. I got it. Dune, actually, they used um, their voice as a weapon. They would like, they would go, Mwadi! and like, the, and it would like, pff, like it would like, whoa. So like, this is the deal, dude. We are uh, like this Cali, like I've heard about Cali vibes, man, my whole life. I didn't realize that like, it wasn't just Cali vibes. It's like, you know, the cannabis industry got me into vibrations of light. Music got me into vibrations of sound. California, specifically, like, this dude on the beach, the sacred geometry guy, right? This is like the uh, vibration of us. So what I think is uh, beyond our three-dimensional perception is like the, uh, the energy field that surrounds us. You ever notice how when you hug somebody, some people like, it's just flesh, and then other people like, it's like Yeah. Right, so I'm starting to really tap more into us as, uh, as antennas, receivers, and transmitters. Yeah. And, and really starting to like be able to like, do you know my energy field extends like 50 feet, man, almost in every direction. And I can't see it, but I see that that is an example of uh, something that's outside of the perception of our regular three-dimensional environment. It's like the energy that we as people or, or, or as living or even, right, all of it. And then what about the non-linearity of time? 
Well, <laughs> if in fact our consciousness is moving between different dimensions of time and space, you know, like this 23andMe came back and I'm this 99.8% Ashkenazi Jew. And who, what, what is 99.8% of anything, right? I think of uh, like, you know, this Serpinski character. And I think of like, you know, these like ancient, you know, uh, uh, what if I'm an ancient being and a future being and a present being all at the same time? You know, I, I recently uh, had an opportunity to, uh, to sit with someone who I believe has the ability to have higher consciousness speak through them. And man, things have been happening. I think it's called uh, synchronicities. How is it that all these things keep happening to me faster and faster and faster? People come into their life, people come into my life and they are bearing the mark of the sacred geometry. One person, it's a pair of earrings. It's triangular in, in structure for me, man. I think it's because you're paving the road. Well, I thought that. That was the question. I'm like, what's happening? Are people coming into my life bearing the mark and then all of a sudden, like, you know, like uh, the chaos aligns and it's because of some energy that comes in that is like where, bearing the mark of the triangle. And I'm like, what is it? I sat with someone who was like, I'm like, is it like, are they breadcrumbs? Are they, are they signal? Like, are people coming? Like, what's happening? What is happening? And one perspective was, uh, it's not people that are coming into your life. I think the exact quote was, it's you, dude. Mm -hmm. It's you. And you ever come up from underwater where you're like underwater and then all of a sudden you like, you're, you're suffocating, right? Or even you're underwater and you're holding your breath. But when you come above water and you're like, <gasps> and I had that moment, man, as soon as it was like, it's you. And I realized, wow, dude, that's when I really th thought about time being nonlinear. What if past, present, and future were happening all right now? And what if it was actually my higher self? Like I am a artificially intelligent, fully automated in-game character that is being influenced by my higher consciousness. Wow. <laughs> it's a good summary of our last little bit of convo. Yeah, yeah. This is an important thought experiment to actually embody and really subjectively aim to understand better as individuals and then talk to others about. It's a very interesting one. Okay, last couple questions. We talked about this briefly, but do you think this is a simulation? I'm open-minded to the possibility that it very well may be. I'm not attached to that reality, but I'd say that I would be accepting of that reality given my life experience in gaming. As that translates to future generations, I think that the kids coming up these days have a completely leg up advantage by living in these virtual worlds from childhood as it relates to being open-minded for that. And as time moves forward and as technology advances and as we create virtual environments that become realistic and we separate the need for having there to be a screen. Have you seen the new Star Trek Discovery? Do you know that the ship is powered by psychedelic mushrooms <laughs> and warp drive is now quantum drive and they jump between parallel universes? Remember, Star Trek had the first interracial kiss back in the 60s, right? This is a perfect example of media kind of setting the stage for future generations and the possibilities of what might actually be. And hopefully we're doing that with the show. Yeah, dude, hopefully. this is this is the deal, dude. Hopefully. The simulation series. Hopefully.
Amazing. Last question. Please. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Hmm. Us. I think the most beautiful thing in the world is us. Not you, not me, but like collectively, man. I think it's beautiful as we uh, harmonize in our vibrational frequency. I think it's beautiful as we harmonize in our purpose. I think harmony is beautiful. Earth is beautiful and earth becoming a pinnacle, the pinnacle of what it can be in its fullest prosperity is gorgeous. Full harmony. Mr. Pinsky, what a pleasure this has been. Amazing. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This has been super fun. Love it. Love it. Yeah. The super wide ranging conversation too. <laughs> I love Dude. that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had some really powerful wisdoms in this show. We really appreciate learning more about all things related to cannabis as a nutrient for civilization. This has been really enlightening. Um, everyone, I thank you so much. We thank you so much for tuning in. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let us know. Join the community in the conversation. Let's chat about it. Let's spread these messages and get talking to other people about it. Check out Jason's links below to his work, to Ease and Bong Appetit and more. Check that all out in the links below. And continue supporting us below as well. We need to do cool things like continue coming on site to great places like Los Angeles and talking to epic leaders like Ms. Stepinski. And go and build the future, everyone. Go and manifest your destiny into the world. We love you so much. Thanks for tuning in. Peace. Peace. I love it. Come here. Come good here. Stuff. Good stuff, brother. That was awesome. That was great. great. That was good shit, man. Thank you. Okay, so it's Pinsky in the brain. Uh, we're here today <laughs> with Alan. <laughs> Take over. <laughs> it's yeah. Roll with Pinsky. We're here with Alan, and uh, we are in the simulation series. Uh, here to discuss love it. all things uh, considered. Alan, please. Alan, please tell us. Alan, about please it. tell us. All right, all right. So, me, 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 me. Twenty dwarves. Twenty dwarves. Twenty dwarves. Can you do it with me? Twenty dwarves. Twenty dwarves. Twenty dwarves. Twenty dwarves. Twenty dwarves. Twenty dwarves. Okay, as you were. <laughs> now you may start. <laughs> please. I love it. All right. <clears throat>